Amen. Thank you, Pastor Derek. Thank you, young people. Such a joy today. Well, let's take our Bibles and let's open to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians this morning. We're going to have to take off running. We've got a lot of ground to cover. New series. I want to tell you a little bit about that. As you're turning there, Bill Bright shares the story of Massachusetts Governor Christian Herter. He was running for a second term in office and he came to a church barbecue chasing down some votes. And famished as he was, he, uh, he moved down the serving line for the food. He held out his plate. And uh, as he held out his plate for a side of chicken, he said to the lady serving the chicken, uh, excuse me, do you mind if I have two pieces of chicken? Do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? And the lady said, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm only supposed to give one piece of chicken to one customer. And she said, uh, I'm sorry, but that's, that's the rule. But he said, well, I, but I'm starved. I've been out campaigning all day. I, I'm starving. I, I need another piece. And, and she said, sorry, that's the rule, one per person. And uh, Governor Herter was a modest, unassuming man. Well, at this moment, he decided to throw his weight around a little bit. He said, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state. This event is actually being held for me. That's the reason for this whole thing. And the lady responded, sir, do you know who I am? And he said, no, I, I don't. And she said, I'm the chicken lady. <laughs> and the rule stands, one per customer, move it along, sir. <laughs> Love that story. You know, it's hard to stand under pressure, isn't it? And uh, we find ourselves living in times of great pressure, and, and I want to help us stand in these pressurized times. I love this picture I want to put up on the screen here. This is Nazi Germany, and this is at one of the rallies, and I've put it up before, but, but it's just so vivid. You have this crowd, all of them giving that salute, and except there's this one guy over here, and uh, this guy is not having it. Don't you love this guy? He is just, just like, no, I'm not going to be a part of this. Uh, they've hunted him down. He's a guy named August Landmesser, and uh, just arms folded, refusing the salute. Uh, the story goes that, that his wife was actually of Jewish descent, and uh, he in the crowd, in a pressurized environment, he was determined to take his stand. Don't you love that? boldly standing out. And when the time comes for me and for you, don't you want to have that kind of heart, a heart that stands when the pressure is on? You know, the problem today is that the church is somewhat missing its distinctiveness. Uh, in the times that we're living, we've been bullied into confusion. We've been bullied into a place of, of panic. And every single one of us knows that. We've lived in strange times the past two and a half years, have we not? These have been odd times in my lifetime. I can honestly say I've never seen anything like the past two and a half years. It's been times of panic. There's been a worldwide virus. There've, there's been people uh, wearing masks and shutdowns and shaky economy, and, and big tech is censoring free speech more and more, and there's a battle raging in that area of our society. Uh, we have a nation with climbing national debt. Who's concerned about that? Let's see a show of hands. Anybody? No one. Okay. Uh, everyone's concerned about that. Inflation is, is, uh, is reaching an all-time high, 9, 10 percent. Europe is bracing. I saw, I read an article two weeks ago that Europe is bracing for a region-wide uh, uh, recession. War. There's always war. I mean, in my entire lifetime, I've never known a season of peace. There's always been war. Uh, 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 there's been Afghanistan and Iraq and now Ukraine and Russia, and there's just always war and rumors of, of war. We're living in unstable times, and unfortunately, that instability, that instability triggers us, causes us to wonder, could we be living in the last days? I believe we are. Uh, in fact, that's a biblical term. The last days are the time uh, after the resurrection of Christ until now, and I believe we're living in the last days of the last days. 
We're seeing those signs everywhere. 1948, Israel was regathered. A nation that was not came back from the brink. Isn't that interesting? Uh, We've never seen that before, but Israel now has a land. The rise of Russia, that's potentially a precursor to the rise of Gog and Magog and, and, and that northern nation sweeping down, possibly. Uh, We see the rise of something called globalism, this connection of societies across the world. Globalism, I mean, the communication and the travel is at at a time where it's easier than ever to be globally connected. We can have meetings uh, from our home office to other parts of the world. There's more connection than ever before. There's more uh, connectivity between nations than ever before, possibly leading to a one-world government, a one-world superpower, and we see that possibility on the rise. The authoritarianism, that's a word you can write down. I see more authoritarianism than ever before in our time. I've never seen this, but, but in our time we see the government limiting church gatherings, the government telling churches when and how and where they can meet, or they even say you can't meet. We're seeing that like never before. Pastors over in Canada and other parts of the world are being jailed, intimidated, and fined when they speak out against sexual sins. That is coming to America, I guarantee it. And it's been said that the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak the truth. Isn't that a true line that we see in our times? The society will not put up with those who speak the truth. There will be those who rise up. There will be those who, who, who speak out and march against any manifestation of truth. They hate the truth. Those are the times that we're living in. Uh, Authoritarianism. Again, we're seeing fences go up in China around entire regions and and apartment complexes. I've never seen that before. Uh, It it just seems like the walls in that sense and the government is encroaching on freedom like never before. This all feels somewhat new. Unfortunately, though we know and we feel the times that we're living in, We as a people don't know what to do about it. We don't know how to think about it. We don't know what we should be doing as a church. We don't quite know how to respond to the times that we're living in, and that's a tragedy. So with all that, I've been longing for a while to preach a series on the times that we're living in, and how should the church respond to that? And to do that, I've entitled this series, Standing Out When Time is Running Out. I love this this, uh, artwork that our our communications guy, Sean, came up with. Uh, It's a chessboard, and we've got one piece that sticks out and maybe even being attacked, and, and the clocks are, are ticking. The clock is ticking. How is it that you and I can stand out, can boldly stand for Jesus in a time when the clock is ticking and when really it seems like the whole world is against us? And we're going to feel more and more of that as we get to those last days. And so, so I want to help prepare you to stand up and to stand strong in, in those last days, in those final days. And to do that, I want to study the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Um, This is a fascinating book, and it's largely overlooked in the New Testament. It is pastoral. It is prophetic. It is practical. It's sad that it's overlooked because other than Revelation in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians really tells us more about end times than than any other New Testament book other than Revelation. Uh, It talks a lot about the last days and how to stand in those last days. And so we're going to study that, and we're going to get a, a script to follow as a church from this book. This was a church struggling to understand in times, struggling to their response to the last days. They were confused, and I think this is going to be very, very helpful for us over the summer study here. Now, let me say a couple of things here. Christians tend to fall into two ditches when it comes to prophecy and end times, and I think you can probably see both of these in the church world. We tend to fall into one of two ditches. One of them is that we completely ignore the return of Christ. Some Christians live their life like that, just completely ignoring the return of Christ. They treat the second coming of Christ like I treat that clock in the back of the room. Just, just does not matter. Just completely ignore it and try to move on with my existence, all right? That's how some Christians treat the coming of Christ. That's unfortunate. Um, 
That's honestly why so many people are depressed and discouraged and uh, frustrated and defeated in life. I mean, just, beloved, just consider what life would be like if we got up every day thinking, man, today is the day. Today could be the day that I see Jesus. Today could be the day. Think of the mission that you'd live with. Think of the, the excitement that your day could hold. Think about how your trials, their, their weight would sort, of, would sort of diminish if the potentiality of Christ's return uh, was a real thing to you every single day. Now, some people might say, well, I, I really, you know, I'm a new Christian. Maybe I'm not that advanced in my faith. I don't need to be thinking about eschatology. I don't need to be thinking about end times. Well, actually, that's not true. You know, when we look at what Paul did in his ministry, um, Paul was with the Thessalonians five or six weeks. He was only there for three, or three Lord's Days, and, um, and then he left and yet he's teaching them all sorts of things about the return of Christ. He's teaching them about, about the rapture and the day of the Lord and the man of lawlessness, the, the Antichrist. He's teaching them about all sorts of prophetic things. Why? Well, because it's hope giving. It's hope giving. And don't you want to know what's coming next? Don't you want to know what's happened to those who have, who have died and gone on before us? We need to know these things so that we could exist and live with the hope and the peace of God. Somebody say amen. We want that. We need that. It's essential. And if you're a new believer, you need to dig in this morning. The other ditch that people in the church world tend to fall into when we talk about end times is obsession. Everybody say obsession. obsession. Yeah, that's, uh, that one is the one that I see uh, very often in the church world. I call it end times idolatry. Uh, people who fixate themselves on blood moons. And uh, years ago, it was the Y2K phenomena. You remember that? How many of you lived through Y2K? Did you make it? Are you okay? All right, good. You, you remember Y2K was on us, and, and they were afraid that all the numbers would reset, and all the bank accounts would go to zero, and it was, you know, everybody was very fearful during that event. But, but really, what it creates is this obsession with end times, is it, it creates this fanaticism that I see in the church that's very unfortunate. It creates a people that sort of hop church to church to church, whoever's preaching end times material, and there's no connection to the body. There's no love for the people in the body of Christ. There's no deep commitment to the one and others of Scripture. Instead, they're just sort of, sort of fueling their own lust and desires for that topic, and that's unfortunate as well. It ends in a place uh, that's very unhealthy. Uh, a lot of it's marked by things like date setting. How many of you have you've seen this in the church world where the pastor will come up and they'll give a date and a time for the return of Christ. How many of you have witnessed or seen that? A few of you? Yeah, in uh, 1988, there was a book written, and it was entitled, uh, uh, 88 Reasons That Christ Will Return in 1988. Um, it didn't happen, and he wrote a follow-up. You want to guess what the follow-up was the next year? 89 Reasons that Christ will return in 1989. The second one didn't sell as well as the first one, and neither one is selling too well today, uh, as you can imagine. But uh, that's the, the image of sort of the fanaticism that happens uh, as, we, as we deal with eschatology poorly. But it does happen. And so we want to be careful not to fall into either ditch. And I believe that Second Thessalonians helps us know what to do, know what to believe for eschatology, and have a balanced approach. Christ is coming. Christ is coming. We don't know when, so let's be working hard. Let's be, let's be living out the gospel until He comes, and, and Paul's going to teach us how to do that. So, would you stand in honor of God's Word as we learn this simple message, how to stand in the last days? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 says this, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in, in the churches of God for your steadfastness and, the, and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. We're just going to dip our toe in today, but I want to just use these first four verses, and I want to talk about 
what God is doing in the church so that we might stand. I want to talk about our distinction. Uh, when I started this series, and I started looking at the series before we sit down, I, I called a, a, a friend of mine, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who is a professor of, uh, at Dallas Seminary, a professor of Bible exposition. And uh, he told me that, that 77% of evangelicals believe the, the world is living in the last days. How many of you believe we're living in the last days right now? Yeah, see, I think that's true. Most of us would say that. But he said, why don't we act different? And I thought that was a very probing question. Why don't we act different? Why don't we live with a more mission mindset, a more focus? Well, I would argue, and I want to play ball with that, I would argue that, that maybe this is a drunk church. We're sort of drunk on, on the world. We're sort of caught up in our times, and we're not thinking about the return of Christ enough. George Orwell gives the perfect image of this. He says that one morning as he was having breakfast, a wasp landed on his plate and landed on the jelly, a big glob of jelly on his plate, and began just sucking it up and getting excited about that jelly. And he took his knife and he cut, he cut off the end. He cut off the, like the bottom half of the wasp. The wasp didn't even notice. The wasp was so caught up in the sugar rush just sucking in the jelly, and literally the jelly was coming out of his esophagus onto the plate again. Well, it's quite an image that Orwell gives us. And he says, he says, that is a picture of the time that we're living in. We're so caught up in the times. We're so caught up in the entertainment. We're so caught up in the times we're living, we don't sense the desperation Amen. of the times we're living in. So here's where we're going today. Let's put this phrase up on the screen. With time running out, we need a church that's standing out. Amen. With time that's running out, we need to realize the times we're in. We need to realize the the times we're living in, and we need to make a point to stand out in these times. So, may God bless the reading and the preaching of His Word. You may be seated. Let me give you three very simple points to stand out, and I think this will give us a great start to the book. I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit of an overview into this book, into the sermon, but let's look at three ways that we as the church can stand out in the times that we're living in. Number one, number one, you need to recognize distinction. If you're taking notes, you have a handout in your bulletin. It looks something like this. You need to recognize distinction. You are distinct. Go ahead and settle it in your mind. You will not fit in with this world. They will not appreciate you. They will not love you. They will not embrace you as one of, your, of, of their own. You've got to determine that. I'm going to live out as distinct in this world. And we see that distinction in verse 1. Paul begins with a list of a diverse t team here. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Silvanus is, all, is Silas. That's who we're talking about there. Now, I love the diversity of this team. Uh, Paul probably never thought that he would end up on a team like this. There was a time he wouldn't be caught dead with a group like this. There was a time he wouldn't be caught dead with other Christians. And yet, here he is. Paul was one of those individuals who was just too smart for Christianity. He thought himself out of Christianity. He was highly educated, highly trained, and he was too smart for his own good in that sense. How many of you know someone like that? All right? You know someone who sort of is a, a they call themselves free thinkers, and they're, they're, just, they're just too smart for Christ. I think Paul encourages us that if there's someone like that rejecting Christ, be encouraged by Paul. Keep praying for those people. God can save. There came a point where Paul encountered the true and living God on the road to Damascus, and, and God changed him and made him distinct. And that's encouraging that God can do that for your sons. God can do that for your daughters, for your coworkers, for your friends, for your family, and He can make them distinct. And Paul became a distinct Christian. Notice the diversity of Timothy and Silas. We've got Timothy, a pastor, a lead guy. Then you've got Silas. He's sort of a number two. Silas was not a great number one guy. He was sort of a behind-the-scenes guy. He was sort of an associate pastor. He was a support pastor, and he really embraced that over the course of his life. He wasn't a Timothy who was up at the front giving the Word of God. In fact, he was really a support guy for Paul, a number two. He embraced that. I believe that when Paul died, he eventually made his way to Peter, and he became a number two guy for Peter. 
That was just like the source of his ministry. He wasn't a Timothy, that that guy who's coming up as the next preacher, but he was a great supporting guy. And I think there's a great message for us in this. It's a quick point, but to stand out in these last days, it requires finding your place on the team. It requires us doing ministry together as a team, being united as a team, supporting one another as a team, and embracing our place on the team. You know, I'm already praying. We have starting point uh, in between these services. I'm going to be going and teaching in between services and then running back in here to preach second service. Um, but, but I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm so excited about this next group of people who are joining our church. Isn't it great to see the, the sanctuary filling in in these say, sessions? And we've got a whole other crop of people joining us, uh, and I'm excited about them today. But I'm already thinking and praying for them, like, Lord, where are they going to plug in? Where are they going to fit into this, this group, this body, to meet the needs of this body? Some of them may be teachers. Some of them may be supporters. Some of them may be in children's ministry, youth ministry, Uh, We need all of you. We need all of us standing together, and it's a diverse team. Notice it's also a united team. Look at verse 3. Look at the plural pronoun there. We. He speaks in the we. We ought to always give thanks to you. Look at verse 4. We ourselves boast about you. Look at verse 11. We pray for you. And notice his connection to the church. Notice he's speaking as he's a part of this church, and he calls them a distinct people. Notice here in his use of that word church that the church, the church is not a building. I I always have to say that whenever I read uh, Paul's letters. this This is a place that has taken on the name of the people, all right? You understand that, right? that the church is a group of people. I, I think Tim told me this, this building has like 250,000 square foot in it. That's crazy. There are rooms in this place I still have not been in. Um, however, not one square inch of it is the church. The church is the people of God. In fact, it literally means called out ones. Uh, You might write down John 17, verses 14 to 16, Jesus in that high priestly prayer. He says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. We are the called out people of God. We stand together united as a team. And let me talk to you just from my heart today. Uh, we are called to stand in unity together. Over the past two and a half years, I was amazed at the emails that I received. I was amazed at the disunity that, that came up over that period that we're now coming out of. And it was remarkable how easily we were separated over the smallest things. It was remarkable. Friends, what's going to happen when real persecution comes? We have to have this insatiable attitude to love each other and be determined to remain united because I I actually consider that the past two years was just a test. It wasn't the real thing. The real thing is yet to come, and the question remains, will we stand united or are we going to be easily divided and fractured as the people of God? Here we see a united church. Notice what unites us more than anything else. It is not our policies on COVID-19. It is not our policies on mask or no mask. It is not our policies on school or no school. It is not our policies on the hours in which we have services. It is not our policies on the style of the worship. It is none of that. The thing that unites us is in verse 1. Look there with me. It is positional. It is positional. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Couple of things. This is amazing. Couple of things. N- number one, notice this is positional. Our security in these last days are bound up in our relationship to God. Amen. The number one thing that Christians are described as in the New Testament is that phrase, in Christ. It's positional. It is having found our union with Christ, in Christ. And and here we have Christ and the Father. And I love this word, and. It links them together, that that the Lord Jesus Christ, truly God, uh, co-eternal, He is is, uh, co-equal, just as God as God the Father. 
He secures us and God the Father secures us. And so what does that tell us? That, that in these last days, things look uncertain. Don't get fearful. Don't get concerned. Don't get stirred up. Things are feeling uncertain. That, that's okay. In an uncertain time, we are secured by the certainty of the Trinity, Amen. that we are found enduring and secure in Christ, in God our Father. And so in moving world, and in a moving world, we can stand distinct because our eternal position is unmoving. It is settled. So does the world reject you? That's okay. Christ and God will never reject you. It's settled. I'm accepted in every way that matters, and I'm distinct. That means I can live distinct. Rejected by the world? That's okay. I can be distinct. I'm accepted by the Trinity. That's all that matters. Number two, if you're taking notes. Number one, we need to recognize distinction. Number two, we need to receive grace. Oh, grace is such a beautiful word, isn't it? Uh, it's the summary of the gospel. It is the summary of the message that we bring. It's the summary of the message that Paul brought. Grace. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let me give you the aim of the book. You might write this down in your notes. What was the point of this book? Well, uh, three C's here, to comfort, to caution, and to correct. Let's start with that word caution because it shows up in chapter 2. What was going on in this book is you had all sorts of false doctrine floating around about the, the last days and the final days and the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. And, and the people of the book of 2 Thessalonians were stirred up. They were concerned that they were in the day of the Lord. And what was happening is these false teachers were coming in and they were writing false letters. That's a big word. It's called pseudepigrapha false letters, and they were pretending to be the Apostle Paul, and they were stirring up the, the Thessalonians about end times. And we see that in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians. And so Paul, the core message is that Paul is writing to caution against the notion that the day of the Lord was present and, in, and that, that they were in the midst of it now. They were in the midst of the judgment. So he was writing to caution them to correct that theology. There's two other messages. In chapter 1, he wants to comfort them. I hope to do, do that for you. We're living in discomforting days, aren't we? I hope that chapter 1 is a comfort and a reassessment of the times we're living in, and I hope you walk out of here with a mission. Then in chapter 3, he writes to correct. There were some people in chapter 3 who were so caught up in end times that really they were quitting their jobs and they were being lazy bums and they weren't working anymore, and they were just waiting. They were kind of staring at the sky, and, and that's the other ditch. And he's saying, no, don't fall into that ditch. Keep working, keep busy, keep sharing your faith, keep doing ministry. There's more to be done. You want to be found busy. And in chapter 1, he's cautioning them. Chapter 2, he's comfort. I'm sorry, he's comforting them. Chapter 2, he's cautioning them. He's correcting that theology. Then in chapter 3, he's giving, he's giving some, some correction to those who are actually have a bad practice. And I, I want to say this, many of us will fall into some of those bad practices believing these are uh, the last days of the last days. Again, I believe they are. But our practice should be that of busyness. And we're going to see that in this book. And that's the arrangement. In chapter 1, uh, we see the comfort and we see the revelation of Christ. In chapter 2, we see the caution. We see the rebellion. We're going to talk about the, the Antichrist and, and the man of lawlessness, this Antichrist. And that's very prophetic. We're going to see that side. Then in chapter 3, we're, we're going to see a word of, of command. Uh, he's going to show us that responsibility that Christians have to live out in the last days. And I think that's going to be very helpful for us as a church. Now, let's go back to verse 2. Look in your text. Go to verse 2. His message is one of grace. We are to give grace and receive grace in these last days. That's his message. And by the way, that's the message of the Apostle Paul everywhere he went. It was a gospel of grace. Verse 2 says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Everywhere Paul went, he went preaching grace. Romans 3 verse 24 says, we're justified as a gift by his grace and through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That was his message. It's all about the work of grace. And when you understand that grace is the foundation of salvation, what results in that is peace. When I write emails, sometimes I'll use these two words, grace and peace. 
grace and peace. That's the message I give. It's a message of grace. It's a message of peace that results from that message. We can have inner peace even as we go through these last days knowing that we're living out the grace of God. Though we have many trials and persecutions, and we'll talk about that in the book of 2 Thessalonians, these were a people that experienced trials, persecutions. Anybody in the midst of a trial right now? Anybody in the midst of a rejection? Anybody in the midst of trouble? This message is for you, and it's going to result in you receiving the grace of God and living out the peace of God. Now, let me put this map up on the, sc- on the screen. What a contrast Paul's message of grace must have been to the people of Thessalonica. I want you to see where they're at. They are in the heart of pagan territory, okay? This is Greece right here. We've got Corinth down here in the south. Here's Athens. There's Macedonia up here. Thessalonica was right here, and it was a harbor town. It would be like Long Beach. It would, it would be like, like one of the ports of New England. It would be this place of great civilization, great activity, great trade. Some have estimated that anywhere between 100,000 people and 250,000 people, which back then, that was a lot for one area, would live in that port city. Now, now get this, though. It's happening in the heart of pagan territory. Athens is right down here. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got all sorts of pagan activity, a- activity related to Greece. This dot right here is representative of Mount Olympus. So there were all sorts of pagan temples and pagan offerings. There was all sorts of works-based religion happening in the shadow of Mount Olympus right next to Thessalonica. And so as we think about that, we too, we're sort of in the midst of a pagan, works-based, religious culture, aren't we? If you ask the random person on the street, how do I get from here to heaven? How do I get God's favor? What most people will say is, well, I, I think I'm a pretty good person. That's still the very heart of paganism. It's works-based religion. It is trying to earn, trying to bribe God with your good deeds to get to heaven. And it's exhausting. Just imagine the uplifting message of the gospel of grace from the Apostle Paul as he preached that Jesus has done it all. Jesus has done the work of the gospel. Just imagine how freeing that must have been for people caught up in pagan religious activity. And still today, I heard the story just of this morning. Someone telling me a conversation that he had with someone else where they led someone to Christ and, and they believed on Christ. They stopped looking to their own works and they w- looked to the work of Christ. It's an amazing, amazing work. It's freeing. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, he was commending the uh, Thessalonians in the previous letter. He says, you turn to God from idols. You turn to God from, from idols. At what an uplifting message to these Thessalonians that they were no longer had to be enslaved to their works, their false gods of works. And I want to say that to any of you who are here today. Some of you, maybe you came into this room thinking that the way to God is to be a good person. That is false gospel. That is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is that you must look away from your own goodness because you don't have any. Um, You must look away from your own goodness, and you must look to the goodness of Jesus Christ who died in your place for your sins that you might be resurrected to everlasting life in Christ. That's the gospel. We preach it every week here. Uh, Sin, you're a sinner. Salvation, it came through a person named Jesus Christ. He's our Savior, and you must believe in Him. You must repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. It is to trust Him. It's to love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Put all your hope in Him. That is the gospel. It is in His death, burial, and resurrection. I want to encourage you today. It would be so freeing today to turn from your sin and to trust in Him just like that. Oh, the exhaustion of works. You know, this past week I was uh, putting together a swing set. I brought the manual this morning. I was putting together uh, this swing set for my, for my kids. Um... I was really concerned when I read the hour allotment that this would take. And uh, I think for two people, it was something like 24 to 30 hours. Uh, For one person alone, it was something like 50 hours. And I I read this, and I just started thumbing through all the nuts and the bolts and the pieces, and I started to reconsider my life. Um, 
This was a mammoth of a thing to put together. It was frustrating. Uh, I would constantly get it wrong, and I would constantly get the boards backwards, and there were a million screws. And, and then when it was done, there was like 40 screws left over, and I was like… <laughs> I just was so frustrated. And I thought to myself, you know what? It's all said and done. It's finished now, but but oh, what I would have given to just paid someone to do this. <laughs> um, the joy, or how about this? The joy it would have been if I got the message of, hey, Matt, uh, it's all done. We did it for you. And I come home from work one day, and it's just finished. Uh, that, that must have been what the Thessalonians received when they received the message of the gospel. Friends, you do not have to work for your salvation. It's done. And the people who are still caught up in works are frustrated and confused, and everybody's giving them a manual they don't understand. Oh, the joy to know it's done. Grace brings peace. And to a far greater degree, there's nothing like knowing that it's taken care of and you have peace with God. Dear friends, cherish this gospel of grace. That's how you will stand out distinct in this world of religion. It is to cherish the gospel of grace, the very gospel that Paul preached. Be famous, famous not for your own deeds, but famous for pointing people away from works and deeds, and famous for pointing people towards the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. 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 That's distinction. Final point of distinction, and we're done. Final point. We need to recognize our distinction. We need to receive God's grace. How else will we stand? You will stand as you rehearse thanksgiving. And that's what we see in verses 3 and 4. We see Paul's thanksgiving. Uh, he had a very thankful heart. Um, I, I still hold today that, that one of the marks of someone who's truly saved is that they overflow with thanksgiving. Um, I, I get embarrassed from time to time. Does your, does your wife, men, does your wife ever walk into the bathroom and catch you praying and talking to the Lord? Um, my wife does that from time to time. I, I find that the prayer that I pray more than any other prayer is just two words. It's the word, uh, thank you. Thank you. And she caught me the other day, and I was just talking to the Lord, and I was just saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for Central Church, the growth I see, the good things I see happening, uh, the staff I see. I think we have the best staff uh, that I could possibly imagine, and God is just pouring out His grace and His mercy, and, and my heart is just over, overflowing with thankfulness. And that is one of the marks of someone who's truly saved. There's a heart of thankfulness. We see that here in Paul. Vance Havner said this great line. You might even write this down. Some Christians have all their dispensations right, but all their dispositions wrong. Isn't that a great line? They have all their dispensations, all their, their household periods, their, those, those rules by which God governs those, set, those periods and those, those uh, times of the, the life of, of His administration, of His people, but, but they have all their dispositions wrong. Verse 3 shows us our disposition, that thanksgiving is a necessity. In fact, look there in verse 3. Notice that word ought. You might circle that word ought that word is used of paying a debt. In other words, it's, it's like paying a debt is a moral duty, like please don't default on your student loans. Please don't default on the money you owe on your, your credit cards. Don't do that. It's morally, don't do that. It's morally wrong to not pay a debt. In the same way, because you have been saved, there, there is an obligation that is a moral must for every Christian to give thanks when you see God's grace in God's church. What does that mean for us practically? Well, we're going to be different than the culture. This is a culture who's angry, is it not? Is this not a culture that's just critical of everything? Everyone's offended by every little thing. Everybody's ready to do this or that and send the email and do that, and, and they're, just, they're just offended all the time. We're living in offensive times. Paul didn't overflow with offensiveness. He overflowed with boasting not just boasting in his times, but boasting specifically in the church. Everywhere he went, he was speaking with joy of what God was doing in the church. Now, imagine this from Paul's perspective. He was only there for like five or six weeks. He was only there for three Sundays. Um, and then he's gone, and he hears that the church is flourishing. 
And I mean, this is like the, the, the best church plant ever, right? We got there, we were there for a few weeks, we preached the gospel, and then we get word there's an actual church flourishing in the city. Unbelievable. And their faith is going everywhere, 1 Thessalonians 1 tells us. They're just, they're just doing everything in ministry. Their faith is just going everywhere. It's mind-blowing. People need to hear God's work that He's doing at Central Church from your lips. Everywhere you go, they need to see you fixated on the work of God in a culture that's fixated on criticism. One critical thought outweighs ten positive thoughts. I heard that in business school when we were taking marketing. One critical thought outweighs ten positive thoughts. You and I need to be a people concerned with giving those positive, affirmative, uh, thankful thoughts to the world, and Paul models that. He celebrates in thanksgiving. And he has, notice here, he has three objects to be, to be thanks, thankful for here in this passage. Number one, an enlarging faith. He was thankful as he looked at this church that their faith was growing. He wasn't thankful about, you know, they had a beautiful sanctuary. He wasn't thankful that they had a famous pastor who was writing all the books. He wasn't thankful that, that, the, people, that the people were many in number. In fact, all of those things were, were not true. The pastor is unknown. We don't know his name. Uh, they probably didn't have a building to meet in other than a home here or there. And they were probably very few in number. The thing that he's thankful for here is that their faith was flourishing. They had a flourishing faith. Uh, their faith was going everywhere. In fact, the word here has an addition on the front of it. It's the Greek word, or the, group, uh, the Greek um, uh, prefix, huper. It's added to it. It meant that their faith wasn't stagnant. In fact, in the Greek uh, New Testament, this word is somewhat unique. It's, uh, it's super growth. It's explosive growth. Do you have a growing faith? Uh, to have faith supposes that you are a Christian. You can't have a growing faith unless you're an actual born-again Christian. Some of you might be here today and wonder to yourself, why am I not growing? Why am I not advancing? Why am I stagnant? First, you have to ask the question, am I born again? Am I truly saved? And if you are, you ought to have a growing faith. You ought to do the things that grow faith. What is it that grows faith? Well, verse 4 shows us that it's trauma. Notice that phrase, in all your persecutions. In all your persecutions. This is one of the hard things that Pastor Derek mentioned in his opening Hard days come to us all, but, but no one grows in the easy days. It's actually times of persecution, times of hardship. That's where the Lord grows us. That's one of the ways God grows our faith. Also in training. This is just spiritual discipline. I, I, meet, from I meet with people from time to time, and nine times out of ten, if there's an issue of their life, part of the reason for that issue or that struggle, if it's not a trauma, if it's not external, it's generally internal. If there's been an adultery, if there's been a failure, if there's been something going on in their life, it's generally a lack of spiritual discipline and spiritual decline in one way or another. It's because they're not abiding in Christ. It's because they're skipping out on reading God's Word. It's because they're skipping out on personal worship. It's because they're skipping out on their time of even gathering with the saints, gathering with the people of God. They're not gathering with God's people routinely. They're not in a shepherd group. They're not engaging in the sermon. They're not in their Bibles combating the lies of the devil. They're not, they're not memorizing Scripture that would give them something to fight with, some bullets to be able to take down the lies of the enemy. And that's when they get downhearted. That's when they get defeated. And the, the response is always the same, but Pastor Matt, I'm so, so busy. Friends, everyone is busy. Who's not busy? Let's see a show of hands this morning. Amen? I, I, I would love to meet that person. Um, I've never met you. I've never met someone like you. Um, we're all busy. It's a question of priority. When it comes down to what your life is like and you get options, do you choose Netflix do you, or do you choose deeper growth and deeper experience with God in His Word and with God's people? Paul was thankful that they took the steps to grow and that he saw the priorities of growth in their life. Another reason for his thankfulness 
is love. They had, they had enlarging faith, but they had expanding love. And this is an interesting word for their, their love. It was increasing. That word there is for a river that's brimming and overflowing. It's like, it's like this water at the bank of the Mississippi River, and it's just brimming into the fields. Have you ever, have you ever drawn in, drove into Arkansas, and you see the water just flooding those plains sometimes? Uh, that's the idea here. The love is just spreading out. The levees can't contain it. It's a force of nature. Again, I think a lot of people with insecurities, I think a lot of people with struggles, one of the great cures for depression and anxiety and many other personal items is to get the focus off of you and to get the focus onto loving other people. And this is for all of us, without exception. Notice that it says it's a love of one another. It's the love of one another. That's one of the marks that you're truly saved, First John tells us. Over in John 13, verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's one of the distinct marks of a Christian. That's how we stand out in these last days. We expand and we overflow our love for one another. Our city is sadly littered with denominations and splits, and sadly, Christians have a terrible witness for Christ because we're so quick to divide and split. Amen? Have you seen this? In these last days, God is calling us to stand out as we love each other and we become thankful for the love of each other. Last thought here, and we're done. What else is Paul rehearsing his thanksgiving for? Well, it's hope. He thanks God for an enduring hope. And here we see this ancient triad in the early church. There's faith, hope, and love. But they had a hope that hangs on. They had a hope that endures. And that's really the theme, one of the themes that's going to be woven throughout every sermon as you come back to this place week after week for the summer. These were people who were steadfast in their hope in the midst of persecutions. Steadfastness comes from hope. Paul doesn't minimize the persecutions that they're walking through. Notice in all your persecutions. And that that tells us that there were many. And the word persecutions, it's plural. There's lots of persecutions there. Lots of trouble. And we too, beloved, will have lots of trouble. Notice this other word, afflictions. It's different from persecution. Sometimes it's just cancer. Sometimes it's the afflicted mind and heart of a child that's lost. Sometimes it's a miscarriage. Sometimes it's a relationship. And all of those things, even the days that are the, mama said there'd be days like this days, in all of those hardships, you and I are called to live with hope and to be thankful when we see each other hoping in Christ. I do not see in this study anywhere that we're called to live with fear. The opposite. We're called to live with hope. What if another virus comes? What if, what if things escalate and we get into World War III? What if, do I need to build a bunker? Do I need to, to, to heart, you know, get a bunch of food ready? Do I need to get a wheat grinder? Do I need to, do I need to, uh, protect myself from all sorts of, of, of possibilities? What about global warming? What about, I mean, there's just tons of things where we could be driven into fear. The Christian is not living in fear. The Christian is not losing his mind. Be wise, but not fearful. What is biblical hope? Let's define biblical hope, and then we're going to end with that. It's desire with confident expectation. It's desire with confident expectation. It's a desire for Christ and salvation. More than that, it's the expectation to see Him at any moment and experience the salvation that He brings with Him. It's faith that's waiting for tomorrow. You and I need to display that we are a people distinct. We are a people resting in our hope. And when we see that in each other, we ought to stand out by giving thanks and thanking God for seeing that in each other's life. Not for looking for the bad things that we see in each other's life. There's plenty of people like that, amen? There's a lot of people that will, that will, that will destroy your character and point out the, the failures in your life. We need to be the kind of people who live with thankfulness and gratitude in these last days.
resting in hope, not resting in a political leader, not resting in a new politician, not resting in a new party that's in power. We need to be people who have found our hope in Christ. As we close, Steve Brown tells the story of the ugliest car he's ever seen. He says, well, I was driving the other day. I saw the ugliest car I've ever seen. I mean, this car was just, it wasn't just ugly. It was ugly on ugly. I like that. It had a large gash in the side. One of the doors was held together with bailing wire. Uh, several other body parts were almost completely rusted out. The car's muffler was so loose that, that when it hit a speed bump, it would spark the street. I couldn't tell the original color of the car. The rust had eaten away at much of the paint. So much of the car had been painted over with so many different colors that, that any one of them or none of them could have been the first coat. The most interesting thing about the car, though, was the bumper sticker. The bumper sticker said in capital letters, this is not an abandoned car. That's the point for today. You and I should have a witness as a church that stands out. We may have some door dings in us. We may have some rust building up. And we may at times look pretty messed up. But the overall message of our life is that I am not abandoned. I am distinct. I have a message of grace to give everywhere I go. And I'm overflowing with thankfulness for my Lord, for my church, for His work in me and in His people. And dear friends, if you'll stick with me for the summer, week by week we're going to discover how we can stand in these last days with Christ, in Christ, together as His church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this message. It's a needed one. It is something that uh, has been on my heart for some time. There's so many cultural things happening, and they're happening so quickly. I don't even quite know where to start as I look at this series. But Lord, we trust You to lead us, and even as things develop in the coming weeks, I pray that You'd give the opportunity to speak into some of the cultural things that we're seeing, the rise of globalism, the rise of authoritarianism, um, the rise of… I, I, I don't know outright that we're seeing specifically um, the marks of those final days outright, but we are seeing the things that are leading to them. We're seeing the escalation of our times. And Lord, we expect to see your son, the Lord Jesus, return for his people at any moment. And so Lord, in these days, would you give us grace to trust you? I pray that fear would not be the overall mark of the Christians from Central Church, but Lord, the items of the passage we've just studied, those would be the marks of those who have trusted in Christ. We are people distinct. We're people that are standing out secure in the gospel. We're standing together. Together, We're standing in thankfulness. Lord, help us. Give us grace to do these things. We ask it in the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people say it together. Amen. Let's stand together. I'll be back for a benediction shortly.